Good afternoon. Uh, let's talk about small intestine. Let's start from duodenum first, and after that, we'll talk about uh, jejunum and ileum. Small intestine consists of duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Pronunciation of ileum or ileum it varies between teachers, so I will use probably ileum as a pronunciation because this is what uh, actually more commonly used in uh, northern part of United States. So uh, the small intestine is primary site for absorption of nutrients, as you know, uh, from ingested material, especially uh, jejunum plays important role in the digestion and ileum more kind of playing role in the absorption. So in uh, um, small intestine extends from pylorus to the ileocecal junction, where ileum joins the cecum. Um, uh, cecum is, remember, the first part of the large intestine. Uh, the pyloric part of the stomach um, connected with duodenum, right? So, and duodenal admission being regulated by the uh, pylorus, which is actually in Latin or in Greek, I don't remember exactly, means actually gatekeeper. Gatekeeper. Next uh, slide uh, explaining you uh, basic anatomy of duodenum. Duodenum approximately 25 centimeters in length, so a little bit less than one foot, uh, is first part of a small intestine and also widest and most fixed part of the small intestine. Duodenum uh, forming kind of um, C-shaped structure around the head of the pancreas. And duodenum begins at, at the level of the pylorus on the right side and ends at the duodenal jejunal junction on the left side, as it's shown on this picture. This junction occurs approximately at the level of L2 vertebra, L2 vertebra, two, three centimeters to the left of the midline. And the junction usually uh, takes a form of acute angle, which is called duodenal jejunal flexure. So the duodenal jejunal junction or duodenal jejunal flexure, it's almost the same uh, uh, concept. So let's talk about the four parts of duodenum. The most of duodenum is considered partially retroperitoneal, and except actually the uh, superior of the first part of duodenum. So each part of duodenum, as you can see on this slide, uh, has specific name. So you can call them first, second, third, uh, and fourth parts, or you can call them superior, descending, horizontal, and uh, ascending. You know, horizontal also have a name inferior. So the superior portion is pretty short and is somewhere on the level of L1 vertebra. Uh, descending part is longer and is um, goes along the right side of the L1 and L, uh, up to L3 vertebras. Horizontal part crosses uh, L3 vertebra and ascending part um, approximately five centimeters, also pretty short, and also somewhere on the level of L3, L2 vertebra on the right border of those vertebra and superior border of L2 vertebra it terminates. So those are four parts, and they are shown on the pictures above. So one picture when you're looking from the um, anterior, uh, abdominal wall another is uh, when you are looking on the duodenum from posterior side from posti pos for posterior abdominal wall so called posterior view uh, the first two centimeters of superior part of duodenum immediately distal to the pylorus has uh, actually mesentery so it's pretty mobile as a result of this and uh, this free part which attached to the mesentery quite frequently called ampulla or duodenal cup of the uh, duodenum. All right, so it's probably it has pretty nice um, distinctive radiographic um, signs, uh, and uh, this is what's shown on this picture. And here I'm circling you actually a duodenal cap, and the distal uh, portion of the superior part and the other remaining three parts of duodenum have no mesentery and you have to remember it's very well as a result the rest of the duodenum is uh, immobile immobile because 
right? The, it's um, the, those parts are retropigitoneal. So please keep it in mind. It's very important. Um, and that is actually helps a lot to understand relationship between the pancreas and duodenum. The superior part of duodenum uh, ascends uh, from the pylorus. So we're talking still about uh, superior portion of the duodenum. So first portion of duodenum. Uh, it ascends from the pylorus and overlap by liver and gallbladder. So peritoneum covers a uh, portion of the superior part of duodenum but it is bare of peritoneum posteriorly except for the ampulla. The proximal part has hepatoduodenal ligament. So remember the most kind of uh, the first portion of the duodenum is actually forming this hepatoduodenal ligament um, and uh, the uh, remember hepatoduodenal ligament is part of the lesser amentum. It's attached superiorly and uh, the greater amentum attached inferiorly to the same actually uh, um, mesenterium, right? So to the same ligament. Next is descending part of duodenum. So what you need to know about this part. So it's the bile and main pancreatic duct enter its posterior medial wall. So remember the bile and main pancreatic ducts joining duodenum in the descending part of the duodenum. The, these ducts usually unite before they enter to the duodenum uh, in the form of hepatopancreatic ampulla. Uh, and hepatopancreatic ampulla usually opens the summit uh, of, the, uh, of an eminence called major duodenal papilla and this major duodenal papilla is the structure which you can see if you insert gastroscope uh, or fibrogastroscope into the stomach and proceed behind the pylorus into the descending part of the duodenum. So this papilla is visible. It's possible to do some surgical procedures on the papilla, insert catheters in papilla, inject radiographic material, um, radio contrast material um, in order to visualize uh, not only papilla, not only ampulla, but also major pancreatic duct, bile ducts possible to visualize uh, by accessing uh, duodenal papilla through the ga gastroscope. The descending part of duodenum is entirely, entirely retroperitoneum. This is very important to keep in mind and again I'm repeating the same information. The anterior surface of its pros proximal and distal thirds of the descending part covered by peritoneum. However, the peritoneum reflects well its middle third to form the double layered mesentery of the transverse colon, the transverse mesocolon. So the origin of the transverse mesocolon is from the peritoneum which is covering descending part of duodenum as you can see on this black and white picture below. Next, the inferior or horizontal part of duodenum. It runs transversely to the left, passing over inferior vena cava. All right, and uh, the inferior vena cava, aorta, uh, and L3 vertebra. Superior to it is, uh, is the head of the pancreas and its uncinate process. Okay. So please don't be confused uh, with uh, portal veins. So because portal veins runs superiorly from duodenum, but inferior vena cava runs posteriorly uh, from um, the horizontal or inferior portion of the duodenum. All right. Um, the ascending part of duodenum runs superiorly and along the left side of aorta to reach the inferior border of the body of the pancreas. Uh, it has very important uh, structure actually this area so the ascending part of duodenum curves anteriorly to join the jejunum so that area is called duodenum jejunal junction and we won't be able to see this junction unless there will be some kind of definitive marks in this area and the definitive mark for that area is actually 
do adeno jejunal um, for, for the adeno jejunal junction is actually a uh, suspensory muscle of duodenum or it's called also ligament of trade so this is interesting uh, skeletal muscle tissue which is uh, connecting a diaphragm to the duodenal jejunal junction all right so sleep of skeletal muscles uh, from the diaphragm and a fibromuscular band of smooth muscle from the third and fourth part of the duodenum that is ligament of trade so contraction of this muscle probably happens um, with contraction of the diaphragm and contraction of the muscle widens the angle of duodenal jejunal flexure facilitating movement of intestinal contact the arteries of duodenum uh, they are arise from the one single structure which we call celiac trunk all right and there is also very small branch which coming from superior mesenteric artery from second um, big branch of the aorta the celiac trunk um, supplying duodenum through the uh, gastroduodenal artery so um, gastroduodenal artery branch another branch of this artery called superior pancreatic duodenal artery so it supplies duodenum proximately to the anterior bile duct into the descending part of duodenum and those are branches shown nicely on this picture the superior mesenteric artery through its branch of the inf uh, which called inferior pancreatic duodenal artery supplies the duodenum distal to the entry of the bile duct the anastomosis exists between superior and inferior pancreatic duodenal arteries it's obvious they should be existing so and those anastomosis actually connecting celiac and celiac trunk and superior mesenteric arteries so that is kind of interesting interconnection between those two major branches of aorta on the level of the superior and inferior pancreatic duodenal arteries um, that is kind of a pre pretty important piece of information so occlusions of the celiac trunk sometimes happens occlusions of the superior mesenteric artery sometimes happens so and as a result there will be development of a collateral anastomosis so one of the anastomosis between those two arteries which can actually supply um let's say uh, organs usually supplied by uh, celiac trunk or superior mesenteric artery so this kind of anastomosis is right between the uh, inferior pancreatic duodenal artery and superior pancreatic duodenal arteries um, the veins of duodenum follow the arteries and drain into the portal vein so this is quite important to keep in mind some of the veins drains uh, into the portal vein directly all right some indirectly um, remember there are two major branches of the portal vein superior mesenteric vein and splenic vein um, yes there are many other small branches which are joining a portal vein directly without uh, uh, joining superior and splenic vein so this is what we will talk a little bit right now so um, for example on this picture you can see clearly that there is so-called prepyloric vein uh, which is collecting a blood supply uh, or collecting venous blood from the pyloric part of the stomach and probably from superior portion of the duodenum uh, there is um, so-called pancreata duodenal veins they are mostly drained into the um, superior mesenteric vein all right so that is venous supply nothing specific now let's talk about lymphatic uh, drainage of the um, uh, duodenum the anterior lymphatic vessels of duodenum drain into the pancreata duodenal lymph nodes pancreata duodenal lymph nodes so which are located along the uh, road of superior and inferior pancreata duodenal arteries and into the pyloric lymph nodes which are located in the, around the pylorus so and lie al uh, along the gastroduodenal artery 
The posterior lymphatic vessels pass posterior to the head of the pancreas and drain into the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. Indeed, there's such kind of lymph nodes. And uh, there, let's say, majority of the lymph from those or uh, from the lymph nodes mentioned above, uh, they are the lymph is actually collected into in the celiac lymph nodes, which are located around the celiac trunk. Um, the nerves of the duodenum derived from vagus and greater and lesser splunkic nerves so by way of the celiac and superior mesenteric plexuses from which they are conveyed through the duodenum and through periarterial plexuses extend to the pancreatic duodenal arteries and those nerves play a very important role in regulation of the sphincters in the major, pancreat uh, uh, major pancreatic uh, papilla and in the sphincters located in the um, common bile duct, in the um, major and minor pancreatic ducts as well. Uh, let's talk about clinical correlates, duodenal peptic ulcers. Most of duodenal ulcers occur in posterior wall, a superior part of the duodenum, within 3 cm of the pylorus. This is an area um, and indeed, so majority of the ulcers are in the posterior wall of the duodenum. So as it's shown on this picture, this is actually a pretty dangerous situation because sometimes these um, ulcers can perforate and cause a severe inflammatory reaction inside the, the omental bursa. The superior part of duodenum closely relates to the liver, gallbladder, pancreas, and those structures may become adherent to the inflamed duodenum and also become ulcerated at the, as the lesion continues to the tissue that surrounds it. So this all area could be severely damaged as a result of peptic ulcer um, perforation in the posterior wall of duodenum. Uh, bleedings from gastric or duodenal ulcers commonly occurs so and the most dangerous is actually erosion of the gastroduodenal artery which is right behind the superior portion of duodenum so and as a result the bleeding from gastroduodenal artery uh, will lead to severe accumulation of the blood in the peritoneal cavity not necessarily only in the uh, a mental bursa but it also will be spreading through the rest of abdominal cavity and cause severe peritonitis. Uh, let's talk about uh, just briefly about developmental changes in the um, mesoduodenum why we need to understand a little bit why pancreas uh, not pancreas but why duodenum is so tightly fixed to posterior abdominal wall just keep in mind that during early fetal period of time, the duodenum, actually whole duodenum, uh, as a stomach, as a small intestine, ha as intestine has a mesentery, so it's pretty mobile. But during development, during later fetal period of time, most of it fuses with posterior abdominal wall because of the pressure from overlying transverse colon. If you remember transverse colon indeed overlying duodenum. So as a result this leads to the fusion of connective tissue of the peritoneum which are originally surrounding duodenum. So and it uh, fuses the rest of the connective tissue on the parietal uh, surface or posterior surface of abdominal, abdominal cavity. Because the attachment of mesoduodenum to the wall is secondary, has occurred through the formation of a fusion fascia, the duodenum and the closely associated pancreas can be pretty easily separated during surgical operation and uh, during surgery by uh, from underlying uh, other organs like aorta or kidneys or ureter or um, inferior vena cava so that is at least good news so that we will not damage surrounding uh, retroperitoneal organs by mobilizing um, 
uh, duodenum, for example, for removal of, of the duodenum. Uh, paraduodenal hernias is another important clinical carriage which you should know. Um, there are several uh, inconsistent folds and fossas around the duodenal jejunal junction. And what you see here in this picture are opening in the transverse mesocolon. So right in the place where duodenum forming junction with jejunum so in that area we see actually a uh, so-called paraduodenal fold and paraduodenal fossa. Those two structures are um, creating kind of like an opening near the medial, um, near the uh, duodenum. So and um, loop of intestine actually can enter this uh, opening, can enter this fossa and it may lead to the strangulation. So during repair of paraduodenal hernia, care must be taken also as well uh, about the uh, not injuring uh, the branches of inferior mesenteric artery and vein of the ascending branches of left colic artery which are related to this par paraduodenal fold and fossa. So that is kind of uh, important thing to keep in mind what will be can happen not uh, only as a result of presence of this fossa, that is paraduodenal hernia, what can happen, but also what can happen during fixing paraduodenal hernia situation. So injury also can appear. Uh, there are some, several other uh, area, uh, kind of inconsistent fossa uh, can appear. They are mentioned on, on the slide in the small letters below, so-called mesa. Uh, enterical par parietal fossa of Valdir, uh, the so-called intermesocolic fossa of Bursic, uh and paraduodenal fossa of Lenzert. Uh, those kind of structures um, exist, they could be pockets for the pass, and that is mostly a uh, kind of area where surgeons should be concerned about. Uh, concerning the jejunum uh, and ileum, jejunum and ileum, the second part of the small intestine, uh, the jejunum, begins at the duodenal jejunal flexure, where the alimentary tract resumes an intraperitoneal course, and uh, this is what uh, both parts, jejunum and ileum, are inside of the peritoneum. Together, jejunum and ileum are six, seven meters long. Jejunum consisting approximately two fifths, so it's a shorter ileum, uh, approximately three fifths, it's longer. Uh, and uh, most of the jejunum lies in the left upper quadrant. This is important to keep in mind the of infracolic compartment, whereas most of the ileum lies in the right lower quadrant, as it's shown on this picture. Um, the third part of the small intestine, the ileum, ends at the ileocecal junction, uh, which is a union of the terminal ileum and the cecum, and usually in this area we see a small valve, uh, which is called ileocecal valve. Uh, few words about differences between the jejunum and ileum from physiological, histological point of view. There in reality, there is no clear demarcation between those two uh, parts of the small intestine. Jejunum is the site where all various process of digestion happens, so secretion of enzymes is pretty active in that area as a result of the, uh, of, um, because of th this is highly uh, active area for digestion. Uh, ileum uh, does not have so much secretion of enzymes, but mostly involved in the absorption, what it was digested actually in the jejunum. So um, that's why e ileum has much more fat inside the mesentery, so because it accumulates much more air, um, fat molecules in that area. Um, the ileum has abundant mucosa associated uh, lymphoid tissue, and this is, this is very important. So this, there are two layers of uh, uh, mu uh, lymphoid tissue, mucosa associated lymphoid tissue and pyre patches which you learn in histology. 
Concerning the um, mesentery, uh, mesentery is a fan-shaped fold of peritoneum that attaches the jejunum and ileum to the posterior abdominal wall. So it's look when you are examining abdomen, it's look like a huge foldings are containing fat, significant quantity of the fat, and indeed it, it's a lot of fat. But between the fat, you see also blood vessel. The origin of the mesentery uh, is um, located from uh, somewhere in the area of duodenal jejunal junction on the left side of the vertebra L2. So, and uh, this is also extend uh, the origin or root of the mesentery up to the iliacolic junction and the right sacroiliac joint. So that is area what consider root or origin of the mesentery. It's pretty long actually mesentery. It's approximately a l root is pretty long. It's approximately 15 centimeters. So it's directed obliquely and in, uh, inferiorly to the right as it's shown on this little picture. All right. So uh, the average width of the mesentery from its root to the intestinal border is approximately 20 centimeters so 15 centimeters root long and uh, width is 20 centimeters so, so that is gives sufficient mobility to small intestine the superior blood supply of the jejunum and ileum superior mesenteric artery supplies both jejunum and ileum um, the superior mesenteric artery remember it's on the level of l1 ver vertebra so one centimeter inferior to the celiac trunk so very close but it's inferior and run between the layers of the mesentery sending those multiple branches 15 18 branches to the uh, jejunum and ileum so those branches called jejunal and ileal branches so the arteries, uh, jejunal and ileal arteries, eventually more or less unite to the periphery and they forming um, so-called arterial arcades, arterial arcades, and arterial arcades eventually form vasa rectus, uh, which actually penetrates and supply uh, small intestine. Uh, venous drainage of jejunum and ileum. The superior mesenteric vein drains the jejunum and ileum. It lies anterior and to the right of the superior mesenteric artery in the root of the mesentery, as it's shown in this picture. The superior mesenteric vein ends posterior to the neck of the pancreas. That's why we don't see it here on this picture, uh, where it unites with the splenic vein to form this short vein which we call portal vein which will go to the uh, porta hepatis uh, concerning lymphatic drainage uh, of jejunum and ileum specialized lymphatic vessels located in the intestinal villi so they originate in the intestinal villi uh, remember the intestinal villi are the tiny projections visible actually best of all visible under microscope uh, projections of the mucous membrane that absorbed various uh, nutrients including fat so and the lymphatic vessels uh, in the villi they call lacteals so the lacteals contain very kind of milky like um, substance bile oh no sorry uh, milk like fluid so lymphatic fluid and this fluid is through the uh, various uh, small blood uh, lymphatic vessels passing to the lymphatic plexuses in the walls of the jejunum and ileum and eventually uh, the, those lacteals and lymphatic vessels um, drain uh, into the uh, free layers of the three groups of the lymphatic nodes so first group of the nodes called uh, yuxta intestinal uh, lymph nodes all right located close to the intestinal wall as it's shown here 
Second group is our mesenteric lymph nodes scarred on the level of arteria arcade. And the third group are superior central nodes located along the proximal part of superior mesenteric artery. Um, efferent lymphatic vessels from mesenteric lymph nodes drain to the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. Lymphatic vessels from the terminal ileum follow the ileal branch of the ileocolic artery to the ileocolic lymph nodes. So that is different supply lymphatic drainage for the um, terminal ileum. Concerning innervation of the um, small intestine, so sympathetic uh, and parasympathetic innervation. Sympathetic fibers coming from the um, uh, T8, T10 segments of the spinal cord and they reach the superior mesenteric nerve plexus through the sympathetic trunks and thoracic abdominal pelvic splunking nerves. Uh, so pretty complicated uh, scheme is shown here. So, but the parasympathetic nerves in the nerves to the jejunum and ileum derive from, of course, posterior vagal trunks. So the presynaptic parasympathetic fibers syn synapse with postsynaptic post parasympathetic neurons in the myenteric and submucosal plexuses in the intestinal wall and modify uh, mobility of the jejunum uh, and ileum. In general, sympathetic stimulation decreases motility of intestine and decreases secretion Right, so decreases diameter of the blood vessels supplying uh, small intestine, decreasing or stopping digestion processes. Right, so parasympathetic stimulation has opposite effect. It stimulates digestion, stimulates secretion, uh, increases um, uh, increases. Uh, actually absorption of the nutrients. The small intestines also have important sensory uh, visceral afferent fibers uh, that is actually allow us to feel pain when there's something wrong goes with our intestines. But we have to keep in mind that the intestine is insensitive to this uh, mechanical pain stimuli with like cutting or burning especially from outer side of the intestines. However, it is very sensitive to the distension of, of the uh, uh, bubble loops, right? So, and that is will be perceived as a pretty intense colic pain, spasmodic abdominal pain, right? So that is all done through the uh, visceral afferent fibers. Now let's talk about localization of the pain in the parts of gastrointestinal tract, which is kind of bring you back to the embryology. The, remember the primordial gut comprises of foregut, midgut, and hindgut. The pain arising from foregut derivates, and you need to know those derivates, esophagus, stomach, pancreas, duodenum, liver, biliary ducts. So the pain will be localized in the epigastric region. Pain arising from mid-gut derivates particularly from small intestine, uh, distal to the bile duct, cecum, appendix, a ascending colon and most of the transverse colon, pain will be localized in periumbilical region. So not so well uh, clear definition, um, uh, but that is um, maximum what kind of regarding localization we can tell um, pain arising from him gut derivate so usually it's uh, what distal part of the transverse colon descending colon sigmoid colon rectum pain will be localized in the hypogastric region um, remember the ischemia of the intestine is pretty serious clinical uh, situation so which potentially may lead to the death of a patient. 
and it's not such a rare thing even the blood supply of intestines is pretty vast and abundant but remember there is not so many alternative roads to provide blood supply in case if one artery is severely occluded all right so particularly with occlusion especially of vasorecta vessels by emboli multiple small emboli may result in se severe ischemia of the part of intestine if its arcades are blocked it's not such a bad thing because usually there are several levels of arcades and uh, uh, as a result collateral blood supply to the um, particular area will be restored so uh, what else exaggerate or exacerbates the in, in ischemia in the intestines is general uh, decreased general drop in the systemic blood pressure so and if ischemia is severe which is quite frequently happens if patients suffer from profuse blood loss anemia uh, some kind of uh, problems with the heart which will lead to decrease in the blood pressure for a prolonged period of time necrosis of uh, involved segment may result and uh, this will lead to development of obstruction of intestine because the necrotic portion will not allow pass of the food so the food will start to accumulate uh, these food masses will start to accumulate before the level of obstruction and this will lead to a uh, clinical condition which we call uh, ileus ileus will be accompanied by severe colicky pain due to severe distension of the intestines so uh, vomiting fever dehydration development of peritonitis and that is quite commonly um, a serious and lethal situation if condition is diagnosed early the obstructed part of the vessel may be cleared surgically if condition is diagnosed late uh, period of time even with resection of intestines due to general intoxication the prognosis is really serious and because it's usually uh, infection start to spread through abdominal cavity so it may lead to the serious prob problems uh, now let's talk about ileal diverticuli uh, mechal diverticuli or ileal diverticuli are the same thing so historically we call mechal and then you on usmle it's also quite commonly called mechal diverticuli so this is quite common pathology um, which um, for memorization we can use rule of two so and i will mention this number to quite frequently so for example you need to know it's appear in two percent of the population all right so interestingly more commonly in males all right so it's uh um mechal diverticulum is a remnant of the proximal part of embryonic yolk sac very 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 um uh, kind of early embryonic structure so which eventually lead to formation of the uh, intestines and actually many parts of gastrointestinal tract it is always at the site of attachment of the yolk sac on the anti-mesenteric border uh, border opposite to mesenteric attachment of the ileum this is what is shown here anti-mesenteric border and um, if you're taking an account what is actually a physical location of ileal diverticulum so keep in mind it's usually two feet uh, this is what rule of two two feet uh, from the ileocecal junction all right so uh, in infants and approximately two feet 50 centimeters in adult so um, in some cases it may be attached also to the um, umbilicus and so my but in majority of cases is kind of hanging from the um, ileum um, as it was shown in the picture below uh, close to anterior abdominal wall of all uh, its mucosa mostly contain cells exactly like in the ileum so but because this is pretty ancient uh, kind of embryonic structure so the cells actually sometimes have propensity to differentiate in the various portions of gastrointestinal tract sometimes it could be found that they are uh, actually gastric tissue inside of the ileal diverticuli or could be found jejunal or colonic mucosa so histologically it could be different from the ileum content of ileal diverticuli 
So I will do it if you like with bean clean because this is a pouch which can accumulate masses. Uh, the masses can stay for a while there and this is will trigger inflammatory reactions, maybe infectious process and symptoms of the IL diverticulitis will be more or less similar to the symptoms of the appendicitis. The difference is that pain in case of the appendicitis mostly will be located in the right uh, lower quadrant so the pain in case of the ileal diverticulitis will be somewhere in the periumbilical uh, area. Um, there, if gastric tissue is present, so sometimes uh, kind of casuistic cases appear, peptic ulcers may occur with perforation and development of peritonitis, and this is appear pretty late uh, during life, so it's not necessary children, even for diverticulitis, ileal diverticulitis, most commonly developing in the children, but let's say peptic ulcer formation, sometimes tumors, they develop later in the life, not during early childhood so that is pretty much all about small intestine so next lecture uh, would be uh, your lecture on the large intestine thank you very much have a good day